devotional paths to the divine you may have seen people perform rituals of worship or singing bhajans kirtans or qawalis or even repeating the name of god in silence and noticed that some of them are moved to tears such intense devotion or love of god is the legacy of various kinds of bhakti and sufi movements that have evolved since the 8th century the idea of a supreme god before large kingdoms emerged different groups of people worshiped their own gods and goddesses as people were brought together through the growth of towns trade and empires new ideas began to develop the idea that all living things pass through countless cycles of birth and rebirth performing good deeds and bad came to be widely accepted similarly the idea that all human beings are not equal even at birth gained ground during this period the belief that social privileges came from birth in a noble family or a high caste was the subject of many learned texts many people were uneasy with such ideas and turned to the teachings of the buddha or the jainas according to which it was possible to overcome social differences and break the cycle of rebirth through personal effort others felt attracted to the idea of a supreme god who could deliver humans from such bondage if approached with devotion or bhakti this idea advocated in the bhagavad gita grew in popularity in the early centuries of the common era shiva vishnu and durga as supreme deities came to be worshipped through elaborate rituals at the same time gods and goddesses worshipped in different areas came to be identified with shiva vishnu or durga in the process local myths and legends became a part of the puranic stories and methods of worship recommended in the puranas were introduced into the local cults eventually The Puranas also laid down that it was possible for devotees to receive the grace of God regardless of their caste status. The idea of bhakti became so popular that even Buddhists and Jainas adopted these beliefs. Figure 1, a page from a South Indian manuscript of the Bhagavad Gita. You can observe this process of local myths and legends receiving wider acceptance even today. Can you find some examples around you? A new kind of bhakti in South India, Nayanars and Alvars. The 7th to 9th century saw the emergence of new religious movements led by the Nayanars, saints devoted to Shiva. and alvars saints devoted to vishnu who came from all castes including those considered untouchable like the pulayar and the pannars they were sharply critical of the buddhists and jainas and preached ardent love of shiva or vishnu as the path to salvation they drew upon the ideals of love and heroism as found in the sangam literature the earliest example of tamil literature composed during the early centuries of the common era and blended them with the values of bhakti the nayanars and alvars went from place to place composing exquisite poems in praise of the deities enshrined in the villages they visited and set them to music Nayanars and Alvars There were 63 Nayanars who belonged to different caste backgrounds such as potters, untouchable workers, peasants, hunters, soldiers, brahmanas and chiefs. The best known among them were Appar, Sambandar, 
Sundarar and Mani Kava Sagar. There are two sets of compilations of their songs, Tevaram and Tiruvakkam. There were 12 alvars who came from equally divergent backgrounds, the best known being Peri Alvar, his daughter Andal, Tondra Dipodi Alvar and Namalvar. Their songs were compiled in the Divya Prabandham. Between the 10th and 12th centuries, the Chola and Pandya kings built elaborate temples around many of the shrines visited by the saint poets, strengthening the links between the bhakti tradition and temple worship. This was also the time when their poems were compiled. Besides, hagiographies or religious biographies of the Alvars and Nayanars were also composed. Today, we use these texts as sources for writing histories of the Bhakti tradition. Hagiography Writing of Saints' Lives The Devotee and the Lord This is the composition of Mani Kavasagar Into my vile body of flesh You came as though it were a temple of gold and soothed me holy and saved me. O Lord of grace, O gem most pure, sorrow and birth and death and illusion, you took from me and set me free. O bliss, O light, I have taken refuge in you, and never can I be parted from you. How does the poet describe his relationship with the deity? Philosophy and Bhakti Shankara, one of the most influential philosophers of India, was born in Kerala in the 8th century. He was an advocate of Advaita or the doctrine of the oneness of the individual soul and the supreme God which is the ultimate reality. He taught that Brahman, the only or ultimate reality, was formless and without any attributes. He considered the world around us to be an illusion or maya and preached renunciation of the world and adoption of the path of knowledge to understand the true nature of Brahman and attain salvation. Ramanuja born in Tamil Nadu in the 11th century, was deeply influenced by the Alvars. According to him, the best means of attaining salvation was through intense devotion to Vishnu. Vishnu in his grace helps the devotee to attain the bliss of union with him. He propounded the doctrine of Vishishta Dvaita or qualified oneness in that the soul, even when united with the Supreme God, remained distinct. Ramanuja's doctrine greatly inspired the new strand of bhakti which developed in North India subsequently. Basavana's Vira Shaivism We noted earlier the connection between the Tamil bhakti movement and temple worship. This, in turn, led to a reaction that is best represented in the Veera Shaiva movement initiated by Basavana and his companions like Allama Prabhu and Akka Mahadevi. This movement began in Karnataka in the mid-12th century. The Veera Shaivas argued strongly for the equality of all human beings and against Brahmanical ideas about caste and the treatment of women. They were also against all forms of ritual and idol worship. Veera Shaiva Vachanas These are vachanas or sayings attributed to Basavana. The rich will make temples for Shiva 
What shall I, a poor man, do? My legs are pillars, the body the shrine, the head a cupola of gold. Listen, O Lord of the meeting rivers, things standing shall fall, but the moving ever shall stay. What is the temple that Basavana is offering to God? The saints of Maharashtra. From the 13th to the 17th centuries, Maharashtra saw a great number of saint poets whose songs in simple Marathi continue to inspire people. The most important among them were Jana Neshwar, Namdev, Eknath and Tukaram as well as women like Sakhubai and the family of Chokha Mela who belonged to the untouchable Mahar caste. This regional tradition of bhakti focused on the Vithala, a form of Vishnu temple in Pandharpur as well as on the notion of a personal god residing in the hearts of all people. These saint poets rejected all forms of ritualism, outward display of purity and social differences based on birth. In fact, they even rejected the idea of renunciation and preferred to live with their families, earning their livelihood like any other person while humbly serving fellow human beings in need. A new humanist idea emerged as they insisted that bhakti lay in sharing others' pain. As the famous Gujarati saint Narsi Mehta said, they are Vaishnavas who understand the pain of others. Questioning the social order. This is an Abhang Marathi devotional hymn of Sant Tukaram. He who identifies with the battered and the beaten, mark him as a saint for God is with him. He holds every forsaken man close to his heart. He treats a slave as his own son. Says Tuka, I won't be tired to repeat again. Such a man is God in person. Here is an abhang composed by Choka Mela's son. You made us low caste. Why don't you face that fact, great Lord? Our whole life left over food to eat. You should be ashamed of this. You have eaten in our home. How can you deny it? Chokha's son Karma Mela asks, Why did you give me life? Discuss the ideas about the social order expressed in these compositions. Nath Pantis, Siddhas and Yogis a number of religious groups that emerged during this period criticized the ritual and other aspects of conventional religion and the social order using simple logical arguments. Among them were the Nath Pantis, Siddhacharas and Yogis. They advocated renunciation of the world. To them, the path to salvation lay in meditation on the formless ultimate reality and the realization of oneness with it. To achieve this, they advocated intense training of the mind and body through practices like yoga asanas, breathing exercises and meditation. These groups became particularly popular among low castes. Their criticism of conventional religion created the ground for devotional religion to become a popular force in northern India. Islam and Sufism The sons had much in common with the Sufis, so much so that it is believed that they adopted many ideas of each other. Sufis were Muslim mystics. They rejected outward religiosity and emphasized love and devotion to God and compassion towards all fellow human beings. 
Islam propagated strict monotheism or submission to one god. In the 8th and 9th centuries, religious scholars developed different aspects of the holy law, shariat, and theology of Islam. While the religion of Islam gradually became more complex, Sufis provided it with an additional dimension that favored a more personal devotion to God. The Sufis often rejected the elaborate rituals and codes of behavior demanded by Muslim religious scholars. They sought union with God much as a lover seeks his beloved with a disregard for the world. Like the saint poets, the Sufis too composed poems expressing their feelings and a rich literature in prose, including anecdotes and fables, developed around them. Among the great Sufis of Central Asia were Ghazali, Rumi and Sadi. Like the Nathpantis, Siddhas and Yogis, the Sufis too believed that the heart can be trained to look at the world in a different way. They developed elaborate methods of training using zikr, chanting of a name or sacred formula, contemplation, sama, singing, raks, dancing, discussing of parables, breath control, etc. under the guidance of a master or peer. Thus emerged the Silsalas, a spiritual genealogy of Sufi teachers, each following a slightly different method, tariqa, of instruction and ritual practice. A large number of Sufis from Central Asia settled in Hindustan from the 11th century onwards. This process was strengthened with the establishment of the Delhi Sultanate, Chapter 3, when several major Sufi centers developed all over the subcontinent. The Chishti Silsila was among the most influential orders. It had a long line of teachers like Khwaja Moyanuddin, Chishti of Ajmer, Kutubuddin Bhaktiar Kaki of Delhi, Baba Farida of Punjab, Khwaja Nizamuddin Aulia of Delhi, and Banda Nawaz Gisudaras of Gulbarg. The Sufi masters held their assemblies in their khankas or hospices. Devotees of all descriptions, including members of the royalty and nobility and ordinary people flogged to these khankas. They discussed spiritual matters, sought the blessings of the saints in solving their worldly problems, or simply attended the music or dance sessions. Hospice House of rest for travellers, especially one kept by a religious order. Often people attributed Sufi masters with miraculous powers that could relieve others of their illnesses and troubles. The tomb or dargah of a Sufi saint became a place of pilgrimage to which thousands of people of all faiths thronged. Finding the Lord Jalaluddin Rumi was a great 13th century Sufi poet from Iran who wrote in Persian. Here is an excerpt from his work. He was not on the cross of the Christians. I went to the Hindu temples. In none of them was there any sign. He was not on the heights or in the lowlands. I went to the Kaaba of Mecca. He was not there. I asked about him from Avicenna, the philosopher. He was beyond the range of Avicenna. I looked into my heart. In that, his place, I saw him. He was in no other place. New Religious Developments in North India The period after the 13th century saw a new wave of the Bhakti movement in North India. This was an age when Islam, Brahmanical Hinduism, Sufism, 
various strands of bhakti and the nath pants siddhas and yogis influenced one another we saw that new towns chapter 6 and kingdoms chapter 2 3 and 4 were emerging and people were taking up new professions and finding new roles for themselves such people especially crafts persons peasants traders and laborers thronged to listen to these new saints and spread their ideas some of them like kabir and baba guru nanak rejected all orthodox religions others like tulsidas and surdas accepted existing beliefs and practices but wanted to make them accessible to all tulsidas conceived of god in the form of rama tulsidas's composition the ramacharitra manas written in avdhi a language used in eastern uttar pradesh is important both as an expression of his devotion and as a literary work surdas was an ardent devotee of krishna his compositions compiled in the sur sagara sur asravali and sahitya lahari express his devotion also contemporary was shankara deva of assam late 15th century who emphasized devotion to vishnu and composed poems and plays in assamese he began the practice of setting up namgars or houses of recitation and prayer a practice that continues to date this tradition also included saints like dadu dayal ravidas and mirabai Mirabai was a Rajput princess married into the royal family of Mewar in the 16th century. Mirabai became a disciple of Ravidas, a saint from a caste considered untouchable. She was devoted to Krishna and composed innumerable bhajans expressing her intense devotion. Her songs also openly challenged the norms of the upper castes and became popular with the masses in Rajasthan and Gujarat a unique feature of most of the saints is that their works were composed in regional languages and could be sung they became immensely popular and were handed down orally from generation to generation usually the poorest most deprived communities and women transmitted these songs often adding their own experiences thus the songs as we have them today are as much a creation of the saints as of generations of people who sang them they have become a part of our living popular culture beyond the rana's palace This is a song composed by Meera Bai. Rana ji, I have left your norms of shame and false decorum of the princely life. I have left your town and yet Rana why have you kept up enmity against me? Rana, you gave me a cup of poison. I drank it laughing. Rana, I will not be destroyed by you and yet Rana Why you have kept up enmity against me? Why do you think Meera Bai left the Rana's palace? A closer look, Kabir. Kabir, who probably lived in the fifteenth, sixteenth centuries, was one of the most influential saints. He was brought up in a family of Muslim julahas or weavers settled in or near the city of Benares, Varanasi. We have little reliable information about his life. We get to know of his ideas from a vast collection of verses called Sakhis and Pads said to have been composed by him and sung by wandering bhajan singers. Some of these were later collected and preserved in the Guru Granth Sahib, Panchwani, and Bijak. 
in search of the true Lord. Here is a composition of Kabir. O Allah Ram, present in all living beings, have mercy on your servants, O Lord. Why bump your head on the ground? Why bathe your body in water? You kill and you call yourself humble, but your vices you conceal. Twenty-four times the Brahmana keeps the Ikadasi fast, while the Kazi observes the Ramzan. Tell me why does he set aside the eleven months? To seek spiritual fruit in the twelfth? Hari dwells in the east, they say, and Allah resides in the west. Search for him in your heart, in the heart of your heart. There he dwells, Rahim Ram. In what ways are the ideas in this poem similar to or different from those of Basavana and Jalaluddin Rumi? Kabir's teachings were based on a complete, indeed vehement rejection of the major religious traditions. His teachings openly ridiculed all forms of external worship of both Brahmanical Hinduism and Islam, the pre-eminence of the priestly classes and the caste system. The language of his poetry was a form of spoken Hindi widely understood by ordinary people. He also sometimes used cryptic language which is difficult to follow. Kabir believed in a formless supreme God and preached that the only path to salvation was through bhakti or devotion. Kabir drew his followers from among both Hindus and Muslims. A Closer Look Baba Guru Nanak We know more about Baba Guru Nanak, 1469-1539, than about Kabir. Born at Talwandi, Nankana Sahib in Pakistan, he travelled widely before establishing a centre at Kartarpur, Dera Baba Nanak on the river Ravi. A regular worship that consisted of the singing of his own hymns was established there for his followers. Irrespective of their former creed, caste or gender, his followers ate together in the common kitchen, Langar. The sacred space thus created by Baba Guru Nanak was known as Dharamsal. It is now known as Gurudwara. Before his death in 1539, Baba Guru Nanak appointed one of his followers as his successor. His name was Lehna but he came to be known as Guru Angad, signifying that he was a part of Baba Guru Nanak himself. Guru Angad compiled the compositions of Baba Guru Nanak to which he added his own to a new script known as Gurmukhi. The three successors of Guru Angad also wrote under the name of Nanak and all of their compositions were compiled by Guru Arjan in 1604. To this compilation were added the writings of other figures like Shayad Farid, Sant Kabir, Bhagat Namdev and Guru Tegh Bahadur. In 1706, this compilation was authenticated by Guru Tegh Bahadur's son and successor, Guru Gobind Singh. It is now known as Guru Granth Sahib, the holy scripture of the Sikhs. The number of Baba Guru Nanak's followers increased through the 16th century under his successors. They belonged to a number of castes, but traders, agriculturalists, artisans and craftsmen predominated. This may have something to do with Baba Guru Nanak's insistence that his followers must be householders and should adopt productive and useful occupations. They were also expected to contribute to the general funds of the community of followers. By the beginning of the 17th century, the town of Ramdaspur, Amritsar, 
had developed around the central gurudwara called harmandar sahib golden temple it was virtually self governing and modern historians refer to the early 17th century sikh community as a state within the state the mughal emperor jahangir looked upon them as a potential threat and he ordered the execution of guru arjan in 1606 The Sikh movement began to get politicized in the 17th century a development which culminated in the institution of the Khalsa by Guru Gobind Singh in 1699 The community of the Sikhs called the Khalsa Panth became a political entity The changing historical situation during the 16th and 17th centuries influenced the development of the Sikh movement. The ideas of Baba Guru Nanak had a huge impact on this development from the very beginning. He emphasized the importance of the worship of one God. He insisted that caste creed or gender was irrelevant for attaining liberation his idea of liberation was not that of a state of in inert bliss but rather the pursuit of active life with a strong sense of social commitment he himself used the terms nam dan and insan for the essence of his teaching which actually meant right worship welfare of others and purity of conduct his teachings are now remembered as naam japna kirat karna and vand chakna which also underline the importance of right belief and worship honest living and helping others thus baba guru nanak's idea of equality had social and political implications This might partly explain the difference between the history of the followers of Baba Guru Nanak and the history of the followers of the other religious figures of the medieval centuries like Kabir, Ravidas and Dadu whose ideas were very similar to those of Baba Guru Nanak. Elsewhere, Martin Luther and the Reformation The 16th century was a time of religious ferment in Europe as well. One of the most important leaders of the changes that took place within Christianity was Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546. Luther felt that several practices in the Roman Catholic Church went against the teachings of the Bible. He encouraged the use of the language of ordinary people rather than Latin and translated the Bible into German. Luther was strongly 